Welcome everyone to our Kawinda Community Connections. I'm Kelly Wilkins, your host, and it's so good to be here together with you tonight. I have uh, Yana from WA, who's our urban farmer on tonight. So welcome, Yana. Hi, welcome to everyone. <laughs> so we're going to jump in and, and we've got a big program for you tonight. But before we jump into that, just want to share some little announcements as I do with all the good things coming on. Um, we have our canning, fruit canning course this Saturday. Uh, so if you want to learn how to can your summer fruits um, without the preservatives, then uh, it's at Rouse Hill in Sydney. It's $40. We're trying to keep the price low. You can bring your own choice of fruit or you can pay a little bit extra and then we'll provide it for you. Um, and you can bring your swimmers as well because there's a pool there and you can have a swim and it's lot, be lots of fun. We also, the weekend after, the 18th of March, we have um, the mechanics, DIY motor mechanics course with Graham in Mulgoa near Penrith. And that's on a beautiful five acre property. You're gonna love that. Uh, and he does a beautiful lunch as well. If you jump in before and book for that before the 10th of March, there's actually a early bird discount. Um, so do check out the website. It's at www.myselfreliance.com.au. Um, and there's three parts to his course. So he does a level one, level two, and level three. And so that you get a discount if you do all three levels or at least two of those as well. So um, looking after everybody. Um, and then of course we have, we're gearing up for our expo, our My Self Reliance Expo on the 29th of April. That is like having a Zoom with all the best people in person all in one day. So we've got prizes, we've got a chocolate wheel, we've got silent auction, we've got um, all the guest speakers. You don't want to miss that opportunity. Plus we have pony rides and face painting. It's going to be, it's going to be superb. So now to introduce my guest for tonight, Yana. Thank you so much for joining me here. We've been chatting and I'm so thrilled for everyone to meet you. Um, just tell us a little bit about yourself, Yana. I know that she's been an editor of organic magazines and um, has been um, living a, as an urban farmer for years and now has a larger property. So tell us a little bit and I'll, and I'll, you tell me when you want to share the slides and I can do that for you. Okay, thank you. Um, I started off in finance when I was 17 years of age and um, I worked in finance and I always had a, a, fashion, a passion for um, living off the land because I could see that working in finance that, um, you know, a lot of people were making a lot of money. They had their own um, goals and desires for wanting to, you know, live as, uh, as best and as happy as can be with all the money that they could, um, you know, um, stash in their bank accounts and I just always wondered you know what would ever happen if that money ran out or if they got sick or you know the house got burnt down insurance company you know changed their minds and couldn't you know rebuild another home and all these questions sort of you know came to me and um, and the reason for that is because you know uh, I've seen a lot of people you know have their finances uh, ripped from underneath them you know they gambled it away and um, you know the health is um not has been as good as what they expected or they work themselves to the bone and where they've you know left themselves with you know parkinson's or some sort of you know neurological disorder and um or the marriage had broke up and they lost everything or you know um, made poor decisions but i'll just take you back a little bit when i in 1977 i stayed with my grandmother um we were very poor um uh, we had no running water there was no gas um no electricity um and we, you know, as, as little kids, you know, we were asked to go and fetch our own food. And so, and how we did that was that, you know, we saw a little chook running around in the field and we had to go and grab it, uh, wring its neck and chop it on the chopping chopping block and pluck it and um, and 
prepare the food, you know. It was all a bit gruesome when you're a little kid and when you're being told that you just can't go down to, you know, a store and just pick up a, a chook, cook chook or whatever. You had to go and kill it yourself. And then um, when you've been patting it and giving it names and calling it Gertrude and Matilda and all sorts of things, and then you find that Matil poor Matilda is now, you know, with, um, you know, Peggy the pig and um, sitting there with a bunch of potatoes and, you know, all your favourite produce that you've, you know, painstakingly been growing all those months. So we had to do it very hard, you know, we had to um, grab our own water from the well, which we had to dug it, dig the hole ourselves, and, uh, and then build um, the stone wall made from the stones that we dug out of the ground, <laughs> you know, there was nothing that we had that we could just go out and buy, we had to borrow the you know, like a shovel from next door neighbor and give him you know half a dozen potatoes and a bit of you know jerky and you know some chickens and eggs and whatever and um so we all just you know helped each other so you know the, the man up the road you know might have you know probably something that we want so we would give him something that we had and so we worked together as what you call a commune I don't know if you're all familiar with that. So it was a bunch of families living next door to each other or across the road or across from the paddock or hill or river and up the mountain, down the slope, whatever. And we just go over there and everyone was always happy to help each other. So once it got dark, we all went to bed. Once it got light, we all woke up. <laughs> you know, so if it was light at five o'clock in the morning, we got up at five o'clock in the morning. And so we started working and chopping the wood and make our own produce and um, you know, milk the cows and make cheese and butter and and um, that was our basic staple diet. And then I'd go and make a little slingshot and and um, I'll you know get the bees and run off. You know when the bees go chasing after me and they'll go and quickly climb up there when all the bees are gone and just grab those bees and take them inside. You know get rid of all the bees and there we had honey. <laughs> as simple as that, you know. And so the fresh honey from a hive that was sitting up in a tree. But anyway, I then um, left finance. I got um, pretty fed up of sorting out people's financial you know, problems after 35 years and um, decided that I would start growing my own produce in my own garden. I remembered all the things that my grandmother taught me. And I remember how she taught me how to make yogurt and cheese and butter and bread and, and um, you know, how to make a fire and how to cut wood and and um, so I started, you know, growing my own produce and soon enough, um, people wanted to know, um, you know, how I was growing it so well. And, and then I started running little workshops and, and then uh, from there, I, you know, I've come to be where I am now, Western Australia on 13 acres. Uh, we're off the grid here and uh, we have a little daily pump that um, pumps water out of the dam and we've got an aqueduct, which is um, um, ball, like drinking war water uh, which goes into a um, which gets pumped out into um, a large tank and that tank feeds um, you know anything that's in the house and and also um, our irrigates our, our orchard which we have 200 fruit trees which we planted ourselves and um, 148 um, vegetable boxes um, full of um, vegetables that continuously keep on growing, you know, self-seeded vegetables that just keep on, you know, growing. And um, we've had to turn one of our bedrooms into a pantry. So we've got water floors, uh, yeah, floor to wall full of um, shells um, and shells in the in on the centre part of the, <laughs> the bedroom, um, full of our you know, produce, um, because we've got so much produce that we've had to put them all in jars. This is called a viola jar. If you're familiar with it um, and we just preserve everything um, into these jars everything from you know our fruit and vegetables and we puree you know our tomatoes and so this is what the jar looks like um, you know you sort of pull it up put your, your produce in there you, you boil your tomatoes you might want to just put your tomatoes in whole and um, you know make a vinaigrette and put some herbs in there and then you just seal it there we go, we just seal that and then you put the, the lid on top and then you just cramp it and it seals it. Now I've, I made this, I made 90 of these 
And you're probably thinking, wow, that's a lot of work. I mean, who would want to do all that? I don't have time to make 90 jars. Well, I tell you, this is why the community is so, is so essential to have, is that you go and get, you know, your friend, say, look, would you like to make some tomatoes? Sauce. Oh, yeah, sure, right, fine. And then you get someone else and someone else. So you get about four or five ladies. You all get together, put on a bit of music, you know, put them, you know, make yourself look, you know, presentable and, and you have a nice little song and dance and, you know, whatever. And then you start making this. And people just love it. And walk away before you know it, everyone's gone home with 20 or 30 jars of these tomatoes, which are going to last in your cupboard for the next six months to about a year. Now, I'm still leading this. <laughs> you know, I've just taken, I've just harvested about 50 capsicums, stuffed them, because I said to my husband, what are we going to do with all these capsicums? Okay, what I'll do is I'll stuff them with rice and some, some nice meat and some herbs and just use my, start using some more of these jars and pour them on top. So I just put all the stuffed capsicums into a pot, pour this on top and then boil it. And now what I've done is I've now frozen the stuffed capsicums. <laughs> So yesterday I just took some stuffed capsicums out, stuck them in a pot, and uh, there we go. We've got an instant meal. So we've had to buy another freezer. So we've got um, three freezers and a very large freezer, chock a block full of all our produce. And we've only been here about 14 months, and I have I've not had to go and buy any uh, vegetables. Now, when it comes to meat, I've got a couple of um, cows. Uh, we we've got um, some Herefords, which we actually bought when we we'll, we came onto this property, and we're going to take the two females up to Aruna to a farm where a um, couple of village bachelors are there, and um, they're going to um, you know have some little uh, moonlight dancing with our girls, and hopefully they fall pregnant, and so we hope that we get a couple of calves. Um, the, the males we um, you know, and we turn them into chops and. Um, you know, we get all the meat. I use every, almost every part of the, the, the cattle. Um, I make um, soap from the fat. So I get about 20 to 25 kilos of fat. So I make some soap and I will call it um, Homer Handy Soap because I use that soap on my hair. I use it on my face. I wash all my clothes. I wash the floor. I wash the uh, dishes with it. So I've got one soap that does everything. You know, so, you know, you look at your laundry cupboard and what you find is you've got, a, you know, um, you've got um you know spray and disinfected for you know your bench tops and then you've got um, a, a bottle of something that will go on the floor to wash the floor and then you've got something else that will wash the toilet and something else that will wash the bath no I've just got one soap that does a lot <laughs> does everything awesome. and that soap will last you six months see six months that soap will last now this is what I was to. This is what comes back to wartime preparations. Now, when you're, you want me um, to share this screen because you were talking about tomatoes a minute ago. Yep. So let me just share with everyone what the, your your stockpile. Here we go. Now these viola jars that I bought. Now you probably think, oh look, I can't afford these. Well, I bought these secondhand. Now these viola jars, I got them from a, a secondhand store. Someone came in and you know decided to get rid of them. I bought for them for a dollar. Now, if you can't afford these viola jars or you can't find them, what you could do is, you know, if you know someone that drinks a lot of beer or soda drinks and things like that, start collecting those bottles. And then what you do is buy these. And what they are, they're called gold caps, the gold crown seals used to seal beer or tomato sauces in glass bottles. Now, you buy these. It's a good investment. And then you stick these onto your, you've got a little machine device, and then you start bottling all your preserves, your, you know, your tomatoes, um, your cucumbers and everything else, stick them all in the jars. If you can slot them all in these little bottles and then stick the caps on them. You see, mm. you can do that. See, that's another way you can do it. I didn't know how you so, can get the caps anyway, on those. Pardon? I didn't know how, how do you get the caps on? I Oh, you've got a little, there's a little machine. I haven't got it with me. Or I've just got it in the in the catch cupboard. And then you put the bottle underneath the machine and then the and then it. the lid you put onto the bottle and then it clamps it on like that. So right. it's just like a clamping machine. It clamps down like that. It's really easy. And um, there's something like probably $25, $30. And it's a good investment to have. And then you've got 200 caps in there. I paid something like $7.99 for these. Mm. It's all I paid for them. So if you can get yourself, uh, you know, your hands on one, uh, a couple of bags of those, you'd be all right. Otherwise, you've just got your older jars or maybe start just collecting, you know, your jars that you've, you know, people just throw away, you know, your Legos jars and Domino jars and, you know, start collecting all of those, you know, um, 
and put them in somewhere in a box, store them somewhere, and then when you're ready, um, you want to be able to start using them. But I started off, um, you know, years ago, this guy here is called Vasily. I left my job at um, Ernst & Young. I was working in finance there. So Vasily, I don't know if you know Vasily from the Vasily Garden Show. Anyway, he approached me one day and um, I thought he was a bit strange. Anyway, he knocked on my door and I ignored him. I said to my husband, tell him to bugger off. And then he came back the next day and then he came and then um, he wanted to speak to me because uh, I, I saw him at the garden centre and um, we got talking away and he wanted to come and see me and interview me and put me on the TV and make me some celebrity and all that sort of thing when I was younger and thinner and longer hair. And, um, and then he came the third time and I thought, oh, I'm never going to get rid of this guy. So anyway, I went and approached him. I said, hi, what do you want? I said, I'm married. Look at this. I've got a wedding band. He said, no, no, I'm interested in your garden. I love it. Every time I drove past, I look at your garden. I think, wow, I've just never seen anything like it. And I've been on TV for 35 years. Would I be able to have a look at it? And I said, yeah, you can have a look, but don't touch anything, okay? Anyway, so he comes in and he has a look around. He said, would you be interested in TV? And I said, no, because I don't want people coming here and pinch my food. He said, no, no, people won't know where you're living. I said, well, you know where I'm living. And he said, anyway, three days later, he convinced me and I ended up on TV. And then before I knew it, I ended up on SBS. Before I knew it, I was on TV. Before I knew it, I was on 40 shows. Before I knew it, I became a host. So then after that, I started writing for this magazine here. And then these people contacted me and said, hey, would you like to write from our magazine? And I said, who are you? And they said, oh, we're from Sydney. And I said, okay, how did you know about me? And he goes, oh, we all heard about you in Melbourne. So then I started writing for this magazine and became the editor. I didn't want to become an editor anymore because I was too busy in my garden. I was moving house. So I still write for these people. So this is a really good magazine. I'm not trying to sell it, but it is a good magazine. It's about real people, real gardens. Anyway, enough of that. You want to know a bit more about what I do and uh, what's going on. Now, you've all known about Tiny Homes, have you? Yes. Tiny House. Now, this is a really great book. I've been reading it because I want to build a couple of these. I'm also a builder. <laughs> I became a In your spare choice. time. Yeah, I'm also a qualified builder. I was a registered builder in Victoria um, because my husband was silly enough to go up a ladder one day and he fell down and and he ended up, um, you know, um, dislocating his entire, you know, left side of his body and um, ended up in a wheelchair for 17 years. So then I became a builder um, to finish off the job that he wasn't able to finish because he was um, in a wheelchair. And I started, you know, getting involved in all this sort of thing. And I tell you, it's really great. If you can get yourself one of these... Um, I think it would be really good because, you know, this is where people are heading now. They want to build, they want to move to, um, you know, little properties, you know, one, two acres, build a tiny home and, and become self-sufficient. So you can put an off-grid system on here quite easily. You can put some solar panels up here and a nice water tank and you can have some nice veggies and you can quite easily live sustainably. So, you know, that might be something you might want to consider if you want to get out of the city and then go in with a couple of people. You know, you could probably buy yourself 10 acres, get a couple of tiny homes and build yourself a community. Another thing too is I found very handy. I'm not trying to sell books here and I don't get any commission, but these are some reference books that I have in case the internet goes down. Um, and um, you want to be able to keep some really good books. You don't need a huge library like I have, but I need to get rid of half my books, but I'm keeping just a few. And this is a really good survival guide. The Prepper's Long-Term Survival Guide tells you everything about, you know, um, see this picture down here? Windmill, I've just purchased one of those. Oh, wow. So, um, yeah, it's because I'm off the grid. And even though I'm off the grid and I've got 47 panels and two battery, backup batteries, I still want to be able to get a windmill for my dam down, um, down the bottom of my property. You know, I'm looking at all these fail-safe ideas. Now, who who collects bush foods? You mean foraging? Do you know anything about it? How to identify bush foods? Hmm. Well, we need to start looking at that, looking at weeds. You know, a weed, the seed, this is a kid's book because I want to educate my daughter into eating weeds. Now, do you know the weed, the seed, can stay dormant in the ground for 70 years? 70 years, that's a hell of a long time. And yet we've got these GMO crappy feeds, you know, that Yates have been producing and they can't even last a year. Actually, half of the seeds that you've got there that you buy now um, don't even last, um, you know, they've got a, a, a expiry date of about, what, one, two years. But the, the, but the weeds, the seeds that come, the seeds last for 70 years. So start collecting your weeds now. You've got dandelions, you've got first lane, you've got all sorts of things. Now, the best book that I've ever found was this one here, Eight Weeds. You know, you only have to study the animals. You start looking at, um, you know, the way the rabbits behave 
how intelligent they are. Look at the look at the way that um, you know rodents behave. They know how to survive. They know how to forage. They know what to look for. And yet we're eating crappy food. You know, we're getting our food from stores. We're getting we, we, we're spraying our foods now. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but six seven weeks ago, um, there was a recall on spinach. Now, what was happening is that um, the reason why there was a recall on spinach because people were starting to hallucinate. Now, I rang Vasily, this bloke here, right? I rang him and I said, what's going on? Because I know Vasily, I used to write, I used to be on your TV show and I know the guy who actually produces um, the, the spinach and he's your mate and he grows the spinach and he sells it to Audi, Woolworths and Coles. So what's going on with the spinach? He goes, well, I'll tell you what's going on. I went and, go, went and visited him. He's been told by biosecurity to spray the spinach because of the microbes. Hmm. And I said, what the heck? He goes, well, I've never been out. Wasn't, you know, I, I just produce the spinach. I grow it, put them in bags and send them off into the trucks. The trucks go all over Australia to all the Woolworths and Audi stores, etc. Now he has to wear a full suit, white suit. He's got to have this long spray gun, which is as long as a Nile. And he's got to spray out here because he doesn't wear any of it on him because he's still, even though he's got to protect the suit, he still has to be careful he doesn't get on him. And he's got to spray all this toxic white foam all over the spinach. And yeah. Boris to say, oh, because we want to kill the microbes? Now, insects don't even touch the stuff. Mm. Now, what does it do to your body? What does it do to your immune system? Mm. What does it do to your, to, to your skin? How does it react to your whole body? I tell you, your body can't cope with that. Your body can't eat chemicals. Your body's not made to eat that. If an insect can't eat it, then how the heck are you going to eat it? But we are made to eat it. And this is why we've got to go back to basics. This is why we've got to grow our own vegetables. Now, Yana, you are awesome. You have an awesome garden and uh, an and orchard. So yeah. you still feel the need to have to eat weeds and forage? Yes. Yes, I do. Because weeds and foraging for food, there's a lot of vitamins in your, in your weeds, in your, in your grasses, in your dandelion. There's a lot of vitamins that you can't get in a lot of vegetables. Wow. And um, and you'll find that a lot of the animals are dependent on it. And you think to yourself, well, I know I'm not an animal, but, you know, there's there's a lot of benefits in it. And when you when you think about, um, you know, if there's the hard times comes and just say you get an insect infestation or, you know, um, say, you know, I don't know what your farms are like, but I've had friends of mine who say to me, look, I can't grow a thing in my garden because... You know, I've got a rat infestation, I've got um, rabbit infestation, I've got, um, you know, insect infestation like um, grasshoppers, etc. whatever it is, aphids or white moth, etc. Well, the next best thing is this, weeds. I don't know what it is. It doesn't seem, to, I, I look at a weed and I, I really, I can't really see too many insects eating weeds for some reason. Maybe because there's just so many other um, fruits or vegetables out there that they're eating. But this is what you've got to eat next. Yeah, wow. Yeah, amazing. So this is your life saviour. This is. So there's another book on wild weeds and remedies. There's your wild weeds. Even if you can just get yourself a, a hold of those books. Now, when you read this book, it's not doesn't talk about forest um, foraging. You forage in the sea as well. So there's your, um, you know, uh, you know, what you call this? Sea, yeah, seaweed, or actually all seaweed in Australia you can eat. Hmm. All seaweed. Um, so you, you get your seaweed from the you know sea, take it home, dry it, or give it a wash, dry it, and then I just cut it up. I stick it in the um, like in a whiz, bzz, you know, turn it into a powder, and you just sprinkle it on your foods. Just simple as that. So what I do, just put it in your cooking. Uh, sprinkle it on your you know your meats and um that's that's all you really need and you can do the same with all your weeds too you dry them out if you like or you put them in smoothies and um stick it in with some fruit and eat your weeds with your, your smoothies or just dry them out and just have it as a tea or dry, or dry it out and use it as a herb 
Now, should we show them what your garden yeah. looks like? We'll show yeah, you some photos. Some of the garden, yeah. <coughs> Here we are. All right, can you see that? Yeah, this is a um, the magazine that I write for. The magazine, yep. Annie Malone, she retired last year in April. She was running uh, her own uh, vegan cafe and I interviewed her and um, the, there's a four-page spread on her garden. And um, so this is the latest issue that's just come out. Beautiful. Yep, and she lives here in um, Bumber in WA. Let me see if I can click to the next page. Oh, there it is. Hang on. There we are. Oh, there's your beautiful yep. kids. Yep. These are um, a friend of mine um, asked me to go to her place, um, not very far from me, 25 minutes away. And she said to me, um, there's something wrong with my goat. So I went over there and I said, oh, your goat's pregnant. And she said, no, it's not. And I said, yes, it is. And then uh, she said, it's been making noise. I said, oh, that's because it's, um, it's giving birth. And she said, no, it's not. And I said, yes, it is. So I went over there and um, I saw the, the the goat lying on its side, kicking its legs up in the air. And I said, take a look at its backside. And she said, oh, what's that? And I said, that's its hoofs. So I pulled out the hoofs and lo and behold, this little tacker just came out. And so this is a little ram. Um, I'm looking after him at the moment. He, that's him there on the right. And he's in my lounge room. He actually um, is very, he's toilet trained. He was toilet trained within a day. And, um, you know, he goes outside and does a big long wee, but inside he um, doesn't wee at all. And so we let him walk running around with the cats and the dogs. And so he's, he's now only two weeks um, young and he's starting to eat some chaff. So they can eat, start eating chaff when they're two weeks. And so we're bottle feeding him. And um, his sister, uh, this is a Nigerian um, dwarf goat. Um, she gave birth to two. So she gave birth to a, a ram and... Um, you know, a lovely little girl. So the girl's with the mother and the boy is um, with me. And the reason why the boy's with me, because the owner wants to start um, drinking the milk for herself. And the whole idea of um, her becoming pregnant uh, was because she um, wants to start living off the grid and living sustainably. And she doesn't want to buy milk from the store anymore. She's a scientist. Um, and she's decided that she wants to start um, living sustainably as best as she can. So she's now, um, you know, um, you know, milking the, the little Nigerian, two-year-old Nigerian goat, and she's making her own cheese and um, yogurt and butter. Um, Nigerians, uh, why Nigerians? Because I found their milk to be um, not so goaty. Uh, it's very, uh, it's got a very high fat content. Um, they make, it makes a very nice cheese and a butter and yogurt. And I find that to be one of the best um milk milkers um you know best tasting milk um in goats so the night it's called the nigerian uh, dwarf goat yep i'm surprised you can wean the goat so young that's amazing yeah yeah we're weaning her up um we, we bottle feed the the goat yep amazing. so we've got some goat powder milk um this is some produce um on the left here some tomatoes um that we just um you know continue just to be you know, there's some cherry tomatoes, all sorts of different types of tomatoes in there. Um, we just keep on picking them. Some tomatoes, um, we've just been, you know, the, especially the cherry ones, we just put them straight into a or wash them, put them straight into a, a bag, Ziploc bag, and we just freeze them, throw them straight in the freezer. Um, the bigger ones, you can see there, um, I just, uh, you know, put them in a, I've got this Italiano looking uh, puree machine, and I stick it straight in the machine, and it gets... It um, turns the into liquid and it, it chucks out the skins and the skins I actually dry in the sun and I then bring, once I bring them in, they're all hard and dry. I then put them in um, a whiz and turn them into a powder and I'll put some curry and a salt and pepper and nutmeg and make my own spice. So I use all the tomatoes. I don't get rid of anything. If I could um, use it, I, I will use it. I very rarely chuck anything out. So um, the skins you keep and just use them, um, you know, if you want to make some chicken drumsticks, you just uh, roll the, the the chicken in some, some egg um, and then you just, you know, put the, um, the skin, the dried skins um, that are pureed um, on the um, chicken. 
or just sprinkle it on your steaks and things like that. And then we've got some apples. These are very young apple trees. Um, we planted them about um, nine months ago and we've got apples on them already. That's quick. Yeah, it is pretty quick. I actually cut a branch of an olive tree just as an experiment, just to show people that I'm not wacko and telling lies and fibs and carrying on. And these are pictures just taken down from, you know, someone else's garden. So I, what I did was I did an experiment and I put the, uh, the branch into the ground and I put all my magic stuff that I put in there and um, in the ground. And uh, it was about, I don't know, maybe eight months or so. That stick was, was basically, you know, um, had so many olives on it that there was no leaves that it was just uh, leaning on the on the grass and people said to me well, what's that what's that what and I told it it was a, it was an olive tree it's part of an olive tree <laughs> it was a stick wow. I put in the ground it's got olives on it <laughs> wow you do have I even grow lettuces you know lettuce yeah. I grew lettuce that was as tall as myself I even took a photo of it wow I let the lettuce just grow and grow and grow and grow and I staked it up and I was still pulling lettuces off and taking off the tops. And um, it was about two and a half uh, metres tall. Now, this garden oh, here. Do you, do you believe in the uh, mag, mag, magna electro, how is it, the electromagnetic gardening? I've never, I've not heard of it. No, okay. Okay. No, never heard of it. I just plant it the way my forefathers taught me. I will have to explain to you how I plant a tree, and I have um, I've actually got two photos of how I planted uh, the conventional way of how to plant a, a planting an almond tree, and I planted it the normal way that people do. You just dig a hole and you put compost in there, and chicken scraps, and you stick the the plant the tree in there, and then you put some you know composting you know stuff in there, and then you water it, and then you put some hay around it, and that's the traditional way. Now, I planted that tree the traditional way, and then I planted another almond tree on the other side of the um, garden, and I planted it my way, the way the forefathers taught me, you know, because my forefathers, you know, I told you about them. We had no running electricity and water and all that sort of thing. We, you know, did it the old-fashioned ways. And I'll tell you this, in two years, the second tree, the one that we I put the, the planted the traditional, not, not traditional way, the, the forefathers' way, it grew so tall, it towered over the house. I had to chop it down, not chop it down, but trim it down twice. The other wow. tree that was planted with all the potting mix from Bunnings, etc. cetera, no good. I'll tell you, it was still a dwarf. No, wow. And people couldn't believe it. Actually, no, people that came to my house, they couldn't believe it. I said, hey, that's that tree that you planted, that one, that you, that, you know, the, the traditional way, um, the way, you know, People do it the generic way. And then there's the way that your forefather says, I can't believe there was, you know. So I had to take photos of it just to show people. And now these vegetables here, they were planted nine months ago. Now these banana plants, they're only very tiny. And now these leaves, I tell you, they're the, the width of a queen size bed. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Amazing. I can wrap the whole leaves right around me like this. <laughs> wow. They're huge. And these are all cell seeded, all these veggies. I've got everything from lettuce and kale and, you know, tomatoes and capsicums and you know, I've got finger limes in there, everything. I just throw everything in there. Bang. I don't spray anything. All these kales, I make kale chips. You can cut them up. You stick them, you put a little bit, a bit of oil, drizzle oil, a bit of salt, stick them in the oven and you've got yourself some nice kale chips. It's so delicious. And then I put a little bit of curry on it and um, dip it in some nice um, sauce or you know you can make a nice mayonnaise or something like that and you've got yourself a nice little meal um or you can just uh you know with kale you can make lasagnas put them in soups um or you can just eat it straight raw like that put a little bit of cucumber a bit of tomato grab a little uh, bit of this kale stick it in your mouth and there you've got yourself a meal no yeah. dishes don't have to worry about washing up i love it we get we get the whole lesson from you from go to woe i love it yeah, and no. here you've got your lemons. Lovely. You've got everyone's got to have a lemon tree in their garden. Every Greek, Italian, all these European, they've all got to have lemons. Now, the reason why is because your body, when it goes to eat any of your vegetables, 
It needs to have the acidity in this lemon to be able to digest in your body into your bloodstream. Now, I had a problem with my vitamin D. I was eating all the foods. I was just sanding me out in the sun, doing all the work. And then I go to the doctor and I say, oh, you know, sorry, Yana, but, you know, your vitamin D is low. I said, oh, that's strange. I mean, I'm doing all the right things, sitting out in the sun, doing all the work and et cetera, et cetera. And what's going on? And then one day, this little old woman says to me, you eat a lemon in your garden? You got a lemon in your garden? I said, no, oh, no, not really. I never really thought about lemons. I mean, but too, look, you have to have a lemon in your garden. You've got to eat the lemon with your green veggie. Your green veggie, when your veggie then can go in your bloodstream, but the it's a, like a marriage, you know, the veggie and the lemon, they work together. And that's where you get your vitamin D. Oh, well, lo and behold, I never really thought about that. So now I've got a couple of lemon trees and they're doing really well. Look at that. Another, this is an apple. That's a very young apple tree. It's probably about a meter and a half tall and it's already producing apples. Wow. wow. Yeah. You can do lots of things with apples. You can, you know, um, cook your apples, stew your apples, you make your apple puree, you can um, dry your apples out, all sorts of things. Now, potatoes. This is what they used to do back in the old days. You know, I wasn't born in the war times. I was born in, you know, 1960s. But certainly, you know, back in the days when my grandmother was growing up, we had so many potatoes. When the war came through, what they did was that they extinguished all of their vegetables. But what was hidden underneath the ground was the potatoes. It was all the root vegetables. That's how we survived. Mm. So, you know, you'd stuff your potatoes and you'd put, you know, your, your meats in there and, you, you know, some flour and you mix your flour with, you know, whatever veggies that you could find or what you could forage. You know, there was been mushrooms and truffles and there'd be, you know, wild, um, you know, asparagus in, in, in the garden, in the forest, you know, we tried to look for all these wild, you know, um, foraging foods that we could find and, um, you know, anything that we could find. And then um, we'd stuff it and we'll put, put it in the potato and we'll bake it, okay? Beautiful. So try and be inventive with all your food. There's another potato recipe. And, um, you know, this is um, another food that, you know, people do, they just, get the potatoes and they get whatever dripping and they put it in there in there and they would stick you know probably bits of bread that they had and they would layer it um they would forage for some any weeds like dandelions or whatever they would throw that in there now what do you think this is oh yeah the next one yeah what do you think that is a cookie no like an oat cookie, a cookie. It? i'll tell you what it is you get some you never ever get rid of everything in the when you're cutting a, a you know a sheep or a, a bull you know you keep the tongue you turn it into a pate the livers the kidneys I keep the the intestines so I can make my sausages because what you do I free I put them in the freezer you know all the keep all the intestines take everything out and then squeeze everything out and you keep all your intestines and just put it in liquid put it in a container and then you freeze it then you get your sheep's brain you get some nice um, lentil flour or corn, you know, some, um, you know, flour. Mix it with your sheep's brain with a bit of salt and curry and nutmeg, um, some oats. That's what oats is. Um, you know, if you want to spice it up, put a little bit of chili or something like that in there and you make a nice patty. Stick it on a nice bit of bread, put a bit of tomato and some cucumber. And there you have a lovely little patty. Now, don't tell the kids that's sheep's brain because they won't eat it. But I tell you, it's very delicious. <laughs> that's amazing you've got, you've got to survive you've got to eat sheep's brain you know if that's the only food that you've got left in your back garden you don't get rid of it yeah you know, we used to eat fish you know the um, fish eyes we used to fight over it <laughs> wow everything's edible yeah so you've got some cucumbers if that's the only thing you've got in your garden so make some bit of yogurt and um stick a little bit of um you know some mint um, some mint yep. and yogurt and a bit of uh you know to slice some cucumber um here you've got some you know marmalade um so you get some honey some marmalade um sometimes some people put a bit of nutmeg i do i love nutmeg and crazy over it and just put it on some bit of toast you know if, if that's all you've got left that's what you've got to use stick a bit of lemon rind in there and mix it all up and you know boil it and, and put it on some bit of toast it's really re, re, retraining our kids, isn't it, these days? Yeah. For 
And these are just some, some books that you might want to consider buying, you know, cooking on a ration. Um, it teaches you, you know, how to uh, cook all aspects of food and how to preserve the food and um, how to boil meat without it being tasteless and how to make sausages. So here's some recipes. Yeah. So there's some more, some more time that's recipes. All I, that's all we have. Yeah, yeah, I'll just send a couple of things. And I just wanted to show you, um, so yeah, it's always good to invest in a, some couple of books on how to milk goats and how to take care of them. Um, I'm into nesting boxes these days because I want to catch some birds, especially because they've, um, you know, they can be a bit of a pest. Now, I'll tell you something. I, a few years ago, I interviewed this Italian guy and I said to him, oh, um, oh, I see you living off the land. I see that, you know, you're growing your vegetables and, you know, um, you know, doing quite well. I can see, that, you know, very lovely. I said, oh, what do we just do? And, and usually when I interview these uh, Italians and the Greeks, they always bring a big meal out for me. I don't know why. They must think that, you know, I don't eat enough, but I think I've got enough padding, you know. <laughs> I don't really need much food. And so um, they come out with all this um, lovely spaghetti and, you know, ravioli and et cetera. And I'm sitting there, I'm eating, and I said, oh, very nice. Oh, beautiful. I love the meat. Well, what sort of meat is it? He said, oh, um, it's called 29. I said, oh, what does 29 mean? He said, oh, you know, 29? Tweet, tweet, tweet. I said, I still don't understand. <laughs> he said, well, he goes out there and he actually shoots the 29 birds. You know the birds? Oh. The 29s? The, the 29s? 22s? Or what do you really call them? The Niners. What are they called? Um, Those little birds. Big, you know, well, not little birds, you know. Like, you know, so, yeah, anyway, they come and he said they're a pest. Minor so birds. Shoots, what were they, sorry? Are they minor birds. No, yeah. not minors. I think they're called 29s or 99, not 99s. I'm thinking of that show in number 99. No. Um, I'm sure they're called 29s. <laughs> I have no 22s? Know. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, he shoots these birds and he plucks these little things and um, and then he boils these tiny little bones and takes off all this meat and he puts it into the tomato sauce and I was eating the uh, spaghetti bolognese. <laughs> wow. Didn't and you know it. it. And it was oh, I enjoyed it. I didn't know. I mean, I once he said it was birds, I was starting my imagination was going wild. I started thinking maggots and all sorts of things. But um, you know, it look, it was very tasty, it was very beautiful. But he said, look, you know, we've got um plenty of food around us. We've got birds, we've got pigeons, we've got, you know, plenty of food, um, bees, and that, you know, he he likes to live off the land. He said, if um, you know, my if the birds come to onto his property, he'll shoot them and he'll you know, he'll go and pluck them and he'll eat them. So that's what he does. And so now I think it's always good to pay attention to our little uh, bees. Um, if you've got bees, I would suggest maybe getting a beehive. Um, you know, you don't have to um, be a whiz at putting one together. I've seen some um, some spectacular looking ones. And um, I've even seen beehives um, in nooks and crannies, you know, in, um, in bricks and, uh, you know, in rockies. And, you know, I just leave them and, um, you know, you can always break away some of the, 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 the rocks and try and take some honey out of there. But um, anyway, the best way is to probably put them in a box and then you could be able to take the frames out individually and then you could harvest your own honey. But, yeah, backyard bees is always good to, um, you know, start off with, you know. We so did a My Self Reliance beekeeping um, workshop. Um, fascinating, fascinating to own bees and... Yeah, brilliant source of yeah. Well, we've got 25 hives. I've always had bees. Uh, I used to have them on the roof when I used to live in the city in, um, Co in Coburg in Victoria, and I had 12 hives there. And then, um, but uh, yeah, I've always had always had hives. I just love, love the bees. Um, I, I make a lot of uh, things out of the, the beeswax. So I make cosmetics and lipstick and um, foundations and all sorts of creams and, um, you know, soaps and everything else lipsticks yep another good one is sprouts mm. i think it's really important that we start sprouting as well um and it's another versatile way of you know getting some um good food into into your body uh this is an excellent book it's probably one of the best books i've actually ever had, laid my hands on on sprouts um, now i think at this, this point yana everyone's absolutely enthralled with all the knowledge that you have and the and the all the different topics that you can cover um mm. i don't know if you want to send any questions through in the chat yeah. please do 
Um, but what we thought we would, Jan and I were speaking, and and with all of these uh, nuggets of gold, we thought that we could put together maybe a 10-week program where once a week Jana could teach us um, something that's doable from um, within your home growing um, or storing food or some of those topics. I did put in the telegram um, in the main channel there a bit of a poll so people want to find out more and ask questions. We might put together a bit of a program. What do you think, Yana? We can do a ten-week course uh, for for things for everyone who lives in a home on in in the suburbs. To if you live in on property and you've got a bit of space and you can mm. do some extra things. So yeah, um, I think there's a lot of people think that look. Oh, look, I'm, I don't really know much about gardening. I don't really know much about anything really. I said, would you like to cook? I said, well, there's people out there where you can go out there to the farm, you can go and do a little harvesting and you could be, you know, bottling and, you know, doing something like that, you know, maybe help because there's a lot of farmers out there that, you know, are too busy um, ploughing and seeding and attending to their chooks and to their, you know, um, whatever it is that is, I know, because I'm, I'm always out there, you know, with the cattle and with the sheep and the chickens and all sorts of things and giving birth and running off for being a midwife everywhere, um, giving, you know, delivering babies every, all over the place, you know, I mean, in talking about, you know, goats and, sh you know, sheep and everything else, and that there's just not enough people doing cooking. So if you're a really good cook and you're living in a flat and you're thinking, how on earth am I going to be able to get myself onto a farm? I'm, it's, never, it's not a possibility. I can't do that. Yarn. I said, well, if you can cook, you can get yourself onto the farm, you know, cycle yourself there, help out on the farm, do a bit of cooking, and they'll give you five, six, seven, eight, ten jars of food, as long as you bring the jars back. But, um, you know, you'll find that um, there's always something that you can do. Um, if you're not good at... Um, you know, probably, you know, too old to be bending down and, you know, picking weeds or whatever. I mean, I wouldn't even be doing that anyway. I'll be sending the, the sheep to go and eat the weeds or you go pick up the weeds and eat it yourself. But, um, you know, there's lots of things that you can do. Just join a community, get yourself involved with a, a little group and start, um, you know, helping each other and, you know, seed save. Collect your seeds, for goodness sakes. I've been trying to say to WA people down here in Bunbury, um, is to collect your seeds and I was uh, put together um, a project that um, you know if, if each library was able to just keep a couple of seeds at the front counter and then exchange the seeds to keep one seed and then you know swap one and keep one and I try to bring that in here into the council but they weren't even interested now I see that people are interested if you don't have your seeds you Seeds is life, you know. I remember my grandma used to say to me when, you know, when I when I was a ten year old, and she had this little uh, leather strap around her and this little bag, and she said she pulled something out. So I went, oh, she's going to give me some money so I can go down to the deli and get some get some lollies. Anyway, she went to pull it out, and I went to see it, and I went, what the heck? She goes, oh, you stupid! What do you say that for? I said, but that's not money. She goes, you stupid! You can't eat money. And I said, what is that? She said, it's seeds. Seeds is life. And I said, I can't do anything with that, Grandma. And she said, you're stupid. She said, you put the seeds in the ground, let it grow up, it grows fruit, you eat the fruit, you sell the fruit, and then you have money. Oh, oh well. And so my, my, my grandmother used to say to me, keep your seeds. That is gold. That is what's going to save you. That's what's going to keep this society alive. Now, I know people down here in Western Australia, down the southwest, there are doctors, there are lawyers, there are all sorts of practitioners from, you know, as far as from the A to Z, the alphabet. They're all asking, I don't want your money. I'll exchange my services for a box of food. They want organic food. This is what's happening in WA now and in the southwest of WA. Mm -hmm. There are ads there, you know, um, consultation exchange for organic food this is where we're heading people want genuine food they don't want gmo they don't want this rubbish from you know aldi and coles and woolworths they want backyard the roy mccoy they want no pesticides they want organic produce they don't want chemicals that are coming from the um you know from your sea soles or whatever it is that you pour in there they want pure organic fertilizers Amazing.
you know so this all ends up into your bloodstream so this is what's happening in the, in the southwest and if you can try and grow your mushrooms i grow lots of mushrooms okay you can do it all sorts of ways that's another way try and get your spawns grow your mushrooms get your bees save your seeds learn from from permaculture people like uh, mollison you know there's all sorts of people like see this bill mollison mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we all don't know everything. I don't actually read half these books. This is brand new. Look at this. It's hardly even read. I just, <laughs> I, I just want to show you because some people want to look at a book and read it. I just practice, practice and practice. Like I have been all my, this, this is a book that I picked up from the op shop. See, towards self-sufficiency, country skills for city dwellers. <laughs> you know, yes. well, because they because the city dwellers don't know much. I don't know. <laughs> and then you need to, once you've got all your produce, you need to learn how to ferment. You can't be putting stuff in, in jars and they're not sealing it properly and they find out six months later you open it and then you find there's mould and it's black and it's got this funny, you know, fuzzy stuff growing in it. You need to know how to ferment. You need to know which types of foods needs to go into oil and which ones are best preserved in a brine and in a vine vinaigrette. So you need to be able to capture the the... the you know the essence of that fruit and that vegetable and put it into the best storage so mm. when you go to taste it and you match that up with another food you need to be able to chemically um, marinate it together so you're not eating something going oh gosh that was terrible i don't like the cucumber with that um aubergine or whatever now if things get to a point where you're thinking oh i'm so tired i'm exhausted oh i look like i'm ragged i look like something from ma and pa kettle story you know Look at me, all this work is making me, you know, looking like I'm 10 years older. Well, get into DIY natural therapies. <laughs> Grow, your vegetables. Grow all your <laughs> fruits and things like that. Maybe come up with this beautiful way of growing beautiful vegetables and herbs and um, the honey and using all those foods to make this beautiful cosmetic line. And then you can start selling it to the farmer's wives. I've seen you in a clip Jana, do, do you putting the creams that you've made yourself yeah. on the skin and then eating them? Yeah, that's right. I mean, people <laughs> say to me, you know, people getting lymph, lymph, you know, problems and they, you know, they're putting creams and perfumes around here and, and it's all going into all their lymph glands and then they're finding, oh, I'm sick, you know, sick, of, you know, because they've got all these chemicals. Now, I always say to people, if you cannot eat your makeup, don't put it on your skin because <laughs> the biggest organ that you have is your skin. Yeah. And underneath your skin is your is your nervous system, is your blood vessels, is your corpuscles, and your epidermis layer. And what happens is that all that gets absorbed into that, and what ends up happening it goes into your bloodstream. It changes your DNA. It causes all sorts of problems. So start growing all your produce and start making your own natural produce. Now, what I do is that you get it when you've got a lemon. I've got lots of lemon. Sorry, Yana. Sorry, Yana. Can you unmute your? I've accidentally muted you somehow. You grab your lemon, you squeeze your lemon, put it in your cup of tea, your herbal tea, and maybe put your lemon on your food, on your fish and on your, 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 your lovely salad. And then when you've got your lemon, put a bit of bar carb soda on it, sprinkle a little bit of cup or put some salt or you want it, if you don't, can't afford that, put a bit of salt or put a bit of sand, sprinkle that onto the lemon and then put it under your armpits. And give it a nice massage and now you know what happens to that what that lemon does it gets rid of the bacteria and when it gets rid of the bacteria it gets rid of the pong okay put it underneath your breasts put it on your back put it everywhere around you'll start smelling you know like a, a lemon meringue pie <laughs> <laughs> now we don't want to we don't want to feel overwhelmed we don't have to be amazing at everything like yana but uh and that's what my self-reliance is all about where you can learn from people if you can't read the books you can actually do the courses and so um so that's what we're offering here lots of the courses and programs so you can actually see it in action i know a lot of people have different learning styles and need, some people need to see it so that they can, you know, put it together themselves. And and that's probably the best way of learning because, it, you know, thank goodness you had your grandmother to teach you um, because you had to learn and do it with your hands. Um, and so, you know, it's good to have the books there as a backup, but doing it with your hands 
Um, there's nothing like that at learning to be able to take it in and, and get it into your body then when you're, you know, help that memory when you do it with your hands. So yeah, you could you just name the subject and I'll talk about it and I'll explain it and I'll demonstrate it and I'll have it all here and I'll be able to show everybody. But I think maybe at this stage, I'd like to be able to show people how to grow a tree properly and how to grow and propagate your vegetables so they can start growing healthy and they can start growing quickly you don't want to be putting a tree in the ground like my friend of mine he planted his trees three years ago and I sent him pictures of photos of my trees that I planted nine months ago and he said to me Struth you've got fruit on your trees already I planted my trees three years ago and I haven't got not one bit of fruit what are you doing family secret but you know what here on this show whatever it is that we're doing I'll be able to show you and I'm going to show you and you've got to pack your pen and paper and be prepared because it's very scientific what I'm going to be able to explain to you. I'm going to describe all the components and get really prepared or you might even have to listen to this video again, but I'll show you how to plant a tree and I'll tell you that within about a year you'll have fruit growing and you're going to be gobsmacked. Absolutely. And, um, uh, Nids wants to know, will it work in pots as well? Of course, because it's the same formula. Uh huh. Same formula. But when you're planting a tree, and you've got to look, remember that if a tree is going to grow to say five meters, you've got to be prepared that it will need to get out of that pot and you need to be able to put it into um, it you know, a bigger area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because you need to, when you're planting a tree, you can't just, you know, think that the tree is only going to grow to a certain the, the roots are only going to go to a certain distance. It's not. It's going to, the whole key to a plant or a tree in, to, to, for it to thrive is that the, you need to demonstrate to the tree's roots that they need to compete with each other. And when they're competing and fighting for all those different layers of microorganisms, because there's microorganisms up the top, microorganisms down the bottom, do never, ever talk to each other. Never. They stay up here and the microorganisms down there stay down there. So once the tree starts, the, the, the little tendrils of the, the roots start growing and they start tasting, oh, there's something downstairs. We want that. They start fighting for it. And what's that's doing that? The tree's growing bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And they're just continuously fighting. So once you put it in the pot, it's going to stop. It's going to become dwarfed and you'll start stunting what you call you stunt the growth of the tree. So you need to get it out, but it will certainly work for your vegetables. So if you've got a pot and you want some vegetables in there, the roots are shallow. So you'll find that you'll, you'll get the fruit, your, your, your herbs and your, um, yeah, your fruit, you know, tomatoes are as a fruit and you've got capsicums and, um, you know, cucumbers, etc. And they'll do really, really exceptionally well. So if you want, I can always explain to you about that. I need to prepare myself because I get a big cylinder, cylinder it's glass and I've got to pour everything in there, all the layers in there, and then you can be able to see it, um, all the layers. And then I put a tree in there mm. and I'll have to buy a little tree from um, a shop or something, you know, from a bunny or who knows, no, from a nursery and just demonstrate how those roots talk to all those nutrients because just I'll tell so, some key elements. Yeah, so Maybe. just everyone watching, just type in the chat yes if that's something you'd be interested in, in seeing. Now, you're going to have to do some naughty things. Um, you're going to have to go to the bush. Um, so you're going to have to go to the bush and, you know, the top layer of the bush, there's lots of, you know, leaves. Get rid of those leaves. Now, as soon as you start getting rid of those leaves and you see all those little bugs jumping up and down, that's what you want to capture. Grab that, stick in the bag, run like hell into the into the um, car and make sure no biosecurity people are chasing after you. Then you need to go to the ocean, okay, because you need those microorganisms as well. So you go to the ocean, get some ocean water, a bucket of that, and just take that home. And just keep that and you want to also take some seaweed because you need seaweed as well that's another key mm. element to growing your tree okay so there are two Couple things a nice can... day out with the family coming up yeah just go out there and take a bucket of uh you know like i said you know some bush bugs just dig it out and just take that out as um take the those um so that's this that humus you know decomposing uh 
leaves that's sitting underneath the top layer, that's what you want. You want to take that, take, take a huge big bag of it, a couple of bucket loads and stick it in the back and I'll show you how to plant a tree properly. Sounds amazing. Then you need to start collecting all your chicken scraps. You need that as well. Yep. All right, we can find someone. Well, yeah. that's amazing. I think what we'll, we'll need to book that in and, and everyone can get the recipe for that ready to for when mm. we get together on that. Ah, oh, we've been so, I feel like we've been so well fed tonight and absolutely blessed with all of your knowledge and skills and just so inspired. So we can't wait to have you back, Yana, and to learn some more from you. Thank you so, so much for coming on tonight. And does anyone else have any questions or comments before we wrap up tonight? Uh, you can type them in the chat or you can come off mute. If anyone wants to ask anything, I think, you know, you, you kind of, we could all just sit here and keep listening to your stories all night. They're so, I'm so talking good. about sausages for one hour and clotheslines for three hours. <laughs> <laughs> I know because we had a chat earlier and um, and and the sausages that you have hanging that you just kind of, uh, you know, yeah. nibble as you go and, and all the good food. So we will we'll definitely need to have some recipe nights and some um, probably we'll love that propagating and one about the animals and um, yeah, yes. so many good yeah, I get very passionate when it comes to my cooking. I start using my hands a lot, you know, <laughs> sprinkle this, this and there and everything. <laughs> well yeah. lots of people have come on to the call tonight from different channels and things mostly on telegram but do go into the my self-reliance um channel or chat group and fill in the poll and that will help us to know what you would like to learn and also you can add your own from anything that you've heard or anything that you're interested in learning as well so and we'll definitely get yana back she's got so much cool information and you save so much money i mean i could teach you how to make pasta for 20 cents why go and buy it when you make it yourself make with a whole bunch of friends and make some pasta and stick it in the freezer and just take it out sausages they cost you a fortune just to get a real you know those big italian sausages how much are they now i can i can teach you how to make it for three four dollars and then you can make yourself a side business and sell them for fifteen dollars there you go there you go yeah. and that's yes that's true self-reliance isn't it you have a skill, you have a business. Mm. I love it. I had some, I'll tell you a bit of a story about some cheese that I made. I made this really lovely cheese. I don't know if you've ever heard of Meredith's cheese. It comes in a, um, a nice glass jar with a nice black lid with a nice little lovely black um, gold, um, you know, label called Meredith's cheese. It's goat cheese. Anyway, I made the same thing, exactly the identical cheese to that. Anyway, we had this friend come over and um, some of the cheese I didn't eat, I sort of left it in the fridge a bit too long and I stuck it in, the, in my little compost bin, which was sitting on the, um, on, on the, um, my, my sink. Anyway, anyway, she came over and I said, would you like to try some cheese? And she said, yes. Anyway, she sat there, she went, she was making love to it. Mmm, oh, mm. Oh, I said, what's wrong with you? You're going to give birth or make love? I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Anyway, the next day she gave me 50 bucks, put it, threw it in my face. I said, what's that for? She goes, I want to buy all your cheese. I said, oh, okay. Um, I don't want to sell it to you. I just, you know, I'll give it to you if you want, you know. Oh, no, no, no. I want to, I want to, I want to be your customer. I want to buy your cheese. Anyway, when she went to the sink and washed her hands and everything else because she'd eaten so much cheese she had all over her, she could smell the cheese from my compost bin. So anyway, she opens up my compost bin and I see her eating the cheese out of it. That's good. <laughs> she said, oh, no. she said, oh, I love it. <laughs> it was like mouldy cheese, you know. She loved it so much. And I went, wow, you know, <laughs> this has taken off. And anyway, soon enough, people all heard about my cheese one guy comes to my house and he's uh he has like a contract with the Chinese anyway and he also knows quite a few people restaurateurs um that um, run the restaurants in Ligon Street in Victoria anyway I knew this guy French guy that um runs a restaurant there in Victoria and he says um he's looking for someone who you know makes some really good cheese and so anyway so he asked me he said would you mind making some cheese I said yeah I wouldn't mind Anyway, when he told me how much cheese I had to make, I went, oh, forget it. <laughs> I don't do it for money making. I do it because I want to share it with people. 
you know, this is why I'm this is what I'm all about tonight. I want to share my skills. We can share each other. I don't know everything. I'm still learning. I'm still like a student in this planet learning. And um, and I just want to share it with everybody. You know, if you want to make money out of it, it's up to you. If you want to take the recipe, it's totally up to you. Okay. Tell us, you were telling me a story this after, this morning about uh, your friend with the quails. Can you share share with her on that story about her quails? Yeah, a friend of mine had some chickens. Um, I went over to her place and she said to me, oh, look, I don't um, think I'm going to be able to keep chickens anymore because my chickens are um, not laying, etc." And so when I saw her chickens, I said, how old are they? She said, three years. And she said, I'm just going to give them away. And I said, look, if you've been breeding your chickens for three years and you've been giving them organic food and why don't you eat them she said oh I can't uh, you know I don't know how to kill them so I said I'll do that so I showed her how to kill a chook and um chopped its neck off you know plucked it whatever and then as we plucked it we um, I said to her what do you want to do with it she said I'll stick it in the freezer and I'll cook it you know whatever and I said what are you cooking tonight she said I don't know and I said well why don't we just stick that straight into a pot You've got potatoes, let's put some herbs and, you know, some, you know, some carrots and some turnips, etc. make yourself a soup. So we did that and um, froze the other chook and, you know, put that in the freezer. And then um, she said, oh, what am I going to do with, um, you know, with meat, you know, birds and eggs? And I said, have you thought about quails? Because, you know, her chook chickens were making a lot of noise and she's living in a little suburban block and, and she was worried about, you know, the chickens um, making, um, you know, disturbing the neighbours. So I said, why don't you get some quails? I said, the good thing about quails is that, you know, you, they're inconspicuous. You, can't, you can barely see them. You know, they're very they're camouflaged. Um, you know, you could um, take the, the feathers off with the skin, actually, you know, all at once. Not like a chicken where you've got to, you know, put the, hot, the chicken in um, some warm water and then you've got to start plucking. Um, and then you could just cut it in half and just fry it. And, you know, the, the nice little sweet meat bird, you know, it's easy. And the eggs, uh, pro um, they produce the eggs you know, every 20 days, you know, like you get, um, not 20 days, when I say produce eggs, they can, um, you can incubate the eggs and then in 20 days you've got yourself a little chick. And every day the, the quail will lay an egg, sometimes twice a day. And um, um, one quail uh, would um, lay for three years and they will lay up to 300 eggs a year. So, you know, she said, well, I'm going to start breeding quail. She's a scientist friend of mine and um so I gave her a couple of females and she's now breeding um you know she's got 27 um, eggs in a incubator and she said to me today that um, one of them is, is start looks like it's starting to hatch so she wants mm. to start experimenting with um quail she wants to eat the birds she wants to eat the eggs and she's also breeding and they don't make noise they're very quiet um, you know, you could get 20, 30 little quails in a small little area because they love, they like to forage in the ground and hide underneath bushes. So that might be an alternative if you're living, you know, in a, um, like a unit apartment, you might want just a couple of birds, you know, on a balcony or, you know, um, it, you know, little small back garden. So there you've got your, your meat and then you've got your eggs and then you've got your couple of veggies and then you can barter with other people who grow their veggies. Yeah, in the neighborhood. You don't have to be on a farm. You know, you could be, I was on a 622 square meter block at one stage and we had what you call transition street. Now I didn't transition into a man, but we were transitioning our street. So everyone was growing their veggies and um, they had, you know, chickens and ducks and, um, you know, quails and, you know, they all grew their veggies and we were sharing our veggies with each other. And, and um, you know, every year we would put a table along the street, like, you know, in the middle of the street, we'll block off each side, we'll tell the council we're blocking off and we'll have a harvest festival. So everyone will be sharing their produce, you know, all the neighbours will get together and they'll be sharing their produce. <laughs> it's a great way, you know, if you're living in the, in the city and you don't have a big garden and literally we could literally you know, the, this one street could feed an entire suburb. Mm. See? You don't have to be on a farm. People think, oh, I've got to be on a farm to be able to live off the grid, to be able to, you know, grow my produce. No, you don't. Get yourself in a community. So I was talking about, you know, the commune, you know, get yourself with like-minded people and encourage them to grow veggies. And there might be something, they might be great at growing cucumbers and you might be great at growing lettuces and whatever. And, you know, your abundant produce could be swapped over with someone else's abundant produce. And just remember the layers, you know, grow your turnips, grow your carrots down the bottom and um, your, your um, potatoes. And then you've got um, other vegetables you can grow on top. So, and then rotate, you know, your beds. 
And then, um, you know, and if you've got the little old lady next door who only grows her little azaleas and marigolds in the front and she can't be bothered, you know, about growing anything in the back, ask her, hey, I'd love to be able to do, grow some veggies in your back garden. What, what would you think? And then you can grow your veggies in there and she can share it with her. And this is what people are doing. I know someone who does the same, does the very thing. He's got vegetables growing in his front yard. Gosham, what's his name? He's in Victoria. He's got loads of vegetables in the front. He's got loads of vegetables in the back. And he says, oh, I need, a, I need a, um, to go on a farm. And I said, well, why don't you go and ask that little old lady across the road who's got hardly anything in the back garden, nothing in her front yard. And so now he grows vegetables in her back garden and grows vegetables in her front yard. And she loves it because she said she doesn't have to go and look after it and weed and, and water or anything. Gosh, and Watts goes out there and he does it himself. And she gets to pickings of all the, you know, the vegetables. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, we need to outside, the, outside box. the box again. Yeah. It can be done. Yep. It's very oh, exciting. Uh, I love it. Well, we are, you know, everyone's actually gobsmacked. Usually there's lots of questions coming in, but there's so, so you covered so much ground tonight. I think you're like, well, where do you start? But uh, we definitely need to have you back again, Yana, and uh, and certainly on our summit. So uh, for anyone who hasn't um, seen what we do at, at My Self Reliance in July, we'll hold a 10-day My Self Reliance Summit online. Um, and we'll definitely have to have you on and be one of our guest speakers there. And in the meantime, we will, we will um, I think we need to run some programs so that we can learn in depth all these good things. So Yeah, and people might want to be able to sort of, you know, from now until, you know, I come online again, is maybe ask those, uh, you know, get those questions ready. You know, they might, from, you know, or if you want to, you can always, you know, um, email Kelly and, yeah, uh, or pop the question in the Telegram yeah. chat yeah. and then, you know, we can have Yana answer them from there. So oh, someone just says yeah. I want to go and live at Yana's place. Ah, oh, we <laughs> do. Everyone does. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so do. Oh, we need to join a community, hey? <laughs> ah, we need to multiply you, Yana. Yeah, no, we yeah. need to get people together and um, join a community with like-minded people. That's what you need to do. So, um, yeah. Yes, we need to do it because, yeah, I'm just, you know, very disappointed at um, some of the foods that I buy and I go to taste it and I think to myself, oh, that doesn't taste too good. You know, I think to myself, no, nah, I'm not eating that. No, nah, I've got plenty of food. Um, I don't, I have a, uh, um, 200 fruit trees and a lot of them are growing my fruit, are growing fruit. I've, I've got lots of exotic fruits from Fiji. My, my husband's gone a little bit wild. I don't know what he is. He wants to grow fruit from all, you know, different countries. And, um, you know, from Mediterranean climates, which is very suitable here in WA. And I have tasted some very interesting fruit. There's a chocolate pudding fruit. Wow. Now, it looks pretty ugly. It looks like a rotten uh, banana. You know how a banana goes black and it goes rotten? And it looks like that. But I tell you... It's round and it goes black like a rotten banana. And when you open it up, it smells like a pudding and it tastes so creamy. Now, when I went to go eat it, my husband said to me, oh, are you going to try that fruit? I said, yeah, I will, because we grew it. And he says, it looks ugly, it looks rotten, it looks, it looks like it's putrid or something. I said, well, I think that's what the chocolate pudding you know, fruit looks like. It looks like a pudding. So anyway, here I am, I'm sitting there eating it. Mmm, yum, oh, it tastes just like vanilla. It yeah. looks like a chocolate pudding and it has the um, smoothness and the texture of an avocado. Wow. But they, and when I described it to them, they still didn't want to eat it <laughs> because it looked too brown and mushy but it was beautiful and I ate all the fruit anyway they didn't want to touch it they said no nah, you eat that don't, don't want to eat that fruit I said that's fine so I ate myself some lovely organic non-pesticide food from Fiji without having to go to Fiji so anyway <laughs> I love it I'm coming back to, to, to listen to Yana again just for the accents I've had such a fun time tonight with you Yana <laughs> Anyway, I hope I haven't rattled on for too much. But anyway. Oh, you've been amazing. <laughs> amazing. But we do, are going to wrap up tonight and, um, and you know, we can ask any of the questions that anyone has, pop them into the Telegram chat. 
um, you can send an email to me um, at kelly at myselfreliance.com.au. Um, you can fill in the poll. We will just work out something, Yana, that will have you back again because it's it's been such fun. So um, thanks everyone for jumping on tonight. Uh, and next week we have Paul, who's going to talk to us all about mini greens. Oh, micro greens. I always say mini. Oh greens. yes, micro. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. that's a really another important topic, and and uh, I'm sure um, you'll love that too, Yana. So. Thank you, everyone, and we shall see you all Tuesday at 8 p.m. next week. Yep, it's lovely. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, Thank you, Yana. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks. Thanks for jumping on. Thanks, Yana. Thanks, 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 Kelly. That was fabulous. Really terrific. Thank you, Yana. That's okay. I'll just be myself. (laughs) Don't be a 